Hello, everybody. My name is Teresa Chin. I'm Assistant Dean for the Program for Faculty Development. I am delighted to have a rock star group of panelists with us today to talk about prioritizing well being in uh, today's kind of uh, COVID infested world. Uh, and it is something that we are thinking about in the days of the pandemic and knowing that. Um, Right now, it's been quite difficult for many of our colleagues. So uh, I'm really glad that so many of you um, at this point have taken the time during your busy days to tune in and participate in this. Um, as you can see here, we are hoping for some level of interactivity, but uh, we will be starting with a panel discussion first. So we will be uh, starting the day with uh, um, one of our colleagues, uh, Bodhi, uh, he is at uh, the Hamilton Health Sciences. He's a pediatric psychiatrist, and he will be taking us through some of the novel programming they've developed at their site. Next, I'll be introducing Randy. Randy will be uh, basically kind of highlighting some of the stuff that's going on at St. Joseph's Hospital uh, and in Hamilton, and uh, uh, she'll be kind of taking us through what, uh, what we're up to there. And then uh, after that, we'll have Dr. Karen Sapperson as well. Um, uh, Karen is uh, the uh, associate chair in the Department of Psychiatry, so she'll be um, highlighting uh, what they're doing in that. And then finally, we'll have Mark Walton um, <laughs> talking to us a little bit as a discussant about the overall thing. I will ask uh, if Mark wants to kick us off a little bit with setting the context, and then we'll go into our panel discussions. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Teresa. And uh, thank you for organizing this um, uh, webinar. It's scheduled for an hour, but we can go longer. And I think we're looking to uh, share um, and develop, uh, augment the networks <clears throat> to uh, support each other as we sort of deal with both COVID, but other uh, um, aspects of uh, faculty member wellness and as we <clears throat> work in these are really difficult times so we're looking for ideas um, we're looking for themes and also to know uh, what uh, what we can do for you so thank you very much Teresa thank you and so one of the pre-assignment tasks that we did ask everyone to uh, to tune into and I'll screen share that now uh, was uh, to log in and add a couple of sticky notes to our uh, stressor brainstorming page. So I don't know if any of you have it uh, readily there, uh, but definitely I will pull it up now so that we can all take a look at it. So I will give you the link in the chat box if you wanna take a look there. And also I will screen share it so that everyone can see uh, what, uh, what has come up as some of the stressors so people have really definitely uh, been on here and added lots of cool stuff we started off with some starter pack of a couple of things and some pictures um, but uh, it looks like there's a lot of brainstorming that's been gone on and looking at this board i'm just seeing that there are uh, a wide variety of different things that people have been finding as stressors, right? Everything from financial challenges to turning off work um, and being able to like unwind and not be connected to uh, having the kids at home and moving online uh, with all the teaching. These are all for, uh, forces that have uh, been changed. Uh, there's someone uh, that couldn't attend their uh, daughter's uh, wedding. Uh, that's, that's really powerful stuff. So it can be really troubling for a lot of people these times because of the way that our society has changed. So I, I think that this is a great time to start off. We'll have that Jamboard uh, there for facilitation and discussion later, but um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker um, and I'm gonna put a spotlight on him. So um, uh, Dr. Bodhi Aikintan is a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Yeah, he's a medical director of the RBC Child and Youth Mental Health Inpatient Program, and as well is the Mental Health Assessment Unit uh, lead uh, that's located in the emergency department at the McMaster Children's Hospital. Uh, he clearly has uh, quite an interest in mental health being his profession, but uh, he has bridged out uh, to create uh, something really novel and interesting that I, I wanted to make sure that he got highlighted. So I'm going to spotlight the video on him and have him tell us uh, in his own words what he's been up to at uh, his hospital system. Thank you, Teresa, um, for um, 
coming up with this idea and for um, moderating this event. Uh, it's a, a pleasure for me to be here. Um, so Hamilton Health Sciences has developed a, a number of resources to support the staff and physicians across the corporation as we face this crisis. Um, it is in recognition of the, the varied roles that people play and the pressure that people face both in the context of their daily work, but also recognizing, um, as you can tell from the Jamboard, um, the toll this is taking on their personal lives and how all of these factors can impact critical decision-making, um, especially when these decisions are being made with time and resource limitations, as is the case for all of us. Um, the broad range of these services extends from confidential coaching, um, which is coaching support for those in leadership positions, uh, where individuals can get a 30-minute scheduled coaching session or a quick conversation at the last minute as the need arises. These sessions are offered by twin clinicians through an initiative in our organizational development um, program at HHS. Uh, this will be for directors, managers, and people with administrative responsibilities. Um, in addition to this, the, we, we have a core line, and this core plan has been designed to provide peer support for HHS staff across the corporation as well as physicians. And, and it's designed to extend beyond this COVID-19 pandemic. We're hoping that the service support for our staff um, can actually outlive this current crisis. It is not expected to replace the role of therapeutic professional services. It is in recognition of the sense of isolation that many people in healthcare feel and um, the value of a peer who is um, trained in active listening and, and has skills and an awareness of the system and the challenges that are being faced by that individual. And, and so this is supposed to provide a validating, supportive um, air, um, and they will also have access to a plethora of resources that are available both within and outside the corporation, and they can help direct call out to the appropriate resource. So the core plan is um, four, three, 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 three. So one, four, and four threes. That's one, four, and four threes. And you can call it directly from any of the HHS um, lines, or you can call the McMaster number um, 5212100 and extension 43333. It is available 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week, and calls are confidential. Uh, and the service is not open to the public. Now, as physicians' needs arises, um, we, we recognize that the, the, the needs for physicians are diverse. And depending on the area of specialty, their role, their practice location. And so we consider this core plan a first step to responding to their unique needs. As we gather more information from the callers, especially for, for physicians, it will help us develop a more responsive and supportive framework, meeting the needs of as many physicians as possible. We recognize the range is broad, and uh, uh, we may not meet everybody's needs, but the objective is to try to figure out if there are certain themes to, to what these needs are, and then we can uh, better develop more specific services. Um, in the event that these needs exceed what can be supported simply by peer support, we have been fortunate to develop relationships with St. Joseph's Hospital to facilitate access to another array of services provided in response to the identified need. Um, Randy McCabe will speak to that in greater detail, as will Dr. Sapperson. Um, we encourage physicians to use this hope line and we certainly welcome feedback on its value to you. Uh, I think over the next um, little while, as we gather information, we'll be working on other platforms to offer support to our physician peers, recognizing that perhaps the phone line may not may just be one of a number of ways for people to connect with services. Virtual support groups currently running include a drop-in group for women physicians facilitated by um, Dr. Sabina Nagpal. It runs between, um, I think, from 8 p.m. on Tuesdays. And there are also other professional support groups through CAMH links um, for virtual chat and through the OMA, as well as a, a 13 minute uh, physician, I think it's a mindfulness group that goes on every day. I believe it's from 8 p.m. So we encourage you to access these services. Uh, we encourage you to use the COPE line 43333 as we feel, as you feel the need to, and, and also provide feedback on what you feel may be areas of need that you are identifying um, that we may not have picked up on. And we don't want anyone to feel unheard or alone as we walk through this crisis together. Thank you. All right, excellent. Um, I'm going to take back over so I can introduce uh, 
I'm going to stop the spotlight there. I'm going to put the spotlight uh, now on uh, Randy, who is there. If uh, I can just do that. All right. Now, this is Rand Dr. Dr. Randy McCabe, and she is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at McMaster University. She is a clinical psychologist and director in the Mental Health and Addictions Program at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton, where she's responsible for the Mood, Anxiety, and Seniors Mental Health Programs. Dr. McCabe's research has focused on anxiety and related disorders. She's published a lot of papers, and she's a very impressive lady, and I've had the privilege of being able to interact with her lately uh, through some of the work that we're doing behind the scenes, but I want to put her on the spotlight now to, to tell us about what she's working. Okay, hi everybody. Um, this is a new format for me. I'm not used to talking to myself. <laughs> So <laughs> bear with me. I need the helpline. <laughs> um, so Randy, I think when you have slides, uh, I have your slides. So tell oh, me when okay, you want me to show them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's great. You know, I think that Jamboard really illustrated so many things that are going on for all of us in terms of situations at work and challenges, you know, managing in this context of COVID, COVID that's increasingly being seen. We thought it was like, oh, something we'd get over, but we're increasingly seeing, oh no, this is a long-term Thing, at least for the next couple of years, things are going to be very different. Um, and with that comes all that uncertainty. And that was also on that jam board, just so much uncertainty. And how do you plan to make decisions, not just in work, but also in the personal life and people, depending on your position, you may be doing direct patient care, you may be managing teams of staff or students, um, you know, doing research, all sorts of areas, and, and really no sector is untouched by this. And then the other thing that underscores for all of us is that there's no line between work and home life anymore. So in so many ways, um, you know, we are having stresses and pressures that are going to be ongoing. So it is for the long term. And, and that's why I think it's great to have the opportunity to be here today and talk about some of the programs um, that are out there to provide support. I think one really important thing is as healthcare professionals, we're not used to going for support. We're not used to asking for support. We're the ones who provide the support. We're the ones who provide the care. And um, what's really interesting to me, and I'm gonna tell you a bit about our program that we developed that's been up and running for the past month, is the very low amount of referrals we've had of people calling in for help. And so, you know, at first we thought, oh my gosh, the floodgates are gonna open. We're setting up this uh, call line. We're gonna tell people we're gonna get back to them within 24 hours, um, you know, uh, to provide confidential support. And we thought that we would be flooded and we've not been. And, you know, that's um, concerning to me because I think as health professionals um, and even myself included, um, you know, I think, oh, I don't need help. I can just do this and keep going. And then, you know, then we start to see fraying around the edges. So I, I'm, I'm hoping in our discussions, we can talk and give, share ideas of how do we help people to come forward and, and get the support uh, that they need. So in terms of the program at St. Joseph Bode did a nice transition there. Um, you know, I think, you know, in some sense, maybe people in um, healthcare might feel better talking to peers. They're going through the same things. And Bode's program certainly is um, an excellent one uh, for people at HHS. If you're not at HHS, CAMH has a great, um, uh, you know, ECHO program providing peer support that it's open to everybody uh, in the province. So that's another uh, peer support, um, you know, to, to managing during this time. Um, so at St. Joe's, we're one of five programs, um, you know, supported by the province to provide um, mental health support for people in healthcare or in the community front line. So that could be long-term care, shelters, you know, residential settings, anywhere where people are, uh, you know, in a healthcare related setting um, are providing care and are experiencing strains and stresses due to COVID. And so our doors open broadly and broadly to the whole Southwest region. So not just Hamilton and the surrounding area, but all the way to London and going over to Lake Erie um, would be our area that we're gonna receive referrals from. Um, so we know that with coming, uh, you know, you know, it, 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 I think I mentioned like, you know, that anxiety, stress, uh, compassion, fatigue, uh, those are all normal responses, especially as we see this going, um, you know, into a more longer term stretch and having to figure out how to do things in the long term. Um, you know, I just even know from my own experience that, you know, every day has been very stressful. And at the beginning, there's a lot of information overload. And I've heard people say to me, I do not want to see another 
resource on how to cope. You know, and I think that's, that speaks volumes, right? Like that's just like overload. But, you know, I think that things are settling a bit down uh, with the information overload that seemed like 24 seven at the beginning of this. Uh, basically, this program is, uh, you know, designed to provide pr uh, confidential support. And the team providing the support um, are multidisciplinary. And really, um, you know, we it, we tailor it uh, to what the person needs. So we have many resources and care pathways. You can see there on the slide, um, you know, how to access the, the support. It all goes through Connect at St. Joe's. And Connect is our front door to all our ambulatory services. And so people can call into that phone number there or they can uh, complete a confidential online referral form. And Monday to Friday, they'll be um, responded to within 24 hours. Um, and as you can see here, this is the care pathway. So some people may just need one phone call. Maybe they had a really bad shift or some situation happened and they just wanted to brief, uh, just get a little bit of support. So it may be one phone call. Um, you know, for other people, it may be a higher level of need. And what you can see there is that we have many different pathways. Um, and it doesn't mean you'd progress through each one sequentially. It's really what, what part of the pathway people may um, plug into is dependent on their needs. And so um, they could be ranging from their, the province has put out a lot of self-directed and online resources. So maybe they just want some help getting um, some online self-directed management strategies they could do. Um, there's the peer support I mentioned, uh, you know, in addition to Bode's uh, number, there's also the uh, CAMH ECHO peer support groups that are running twice a week. Um, we have a uh, brief psychoeducation. So through a partnership with the um, um, CMHA, Canadian Mental Health Association, they offer a four session structured um, coping skills uh, strategies, which is uh, based on really support and uh, mindfulness and, and just managing stress. And so some people may be interested in that. We just got up and running this past week, ICBT. And that's where if you don't want to talk to a therapist, you, you know, you can, um, you know, do actually CBT online up to nine sessions related to COVID related stress, anxiety, or mood symptoms. And as you work through the modules, they have them online. Um, you, you're also connected to a therapist so that you can reach out and get that support virtually if you want. So that's one option. That's the ICBT option. And then we do have individual or group psychotherapy, um, evidence-based psychotherapy, CBT, um, for people who uh, may need a higher level of support. And then, you know, in some of the people that we've seen come through, they have had pre-existing um, issues that they had that have gotten reactivated during this time and then we get them back involved with the you know more specialized support and that's that kind of um, step seven there um, so th that kind of highlights the overall uh, different uh, steps there and the general principles are really to how do we boost people's strengths and um, at, at each step so kind of working with um, where people at and a really individually tailored approach Okay, and so that um, is, uh, you know, and then that's the last slide that we're really, can be, I'm really open to people's ideas of why people are coming forward. Uh, this past week, I reported at a provincial call every Monday, we only had two people come. And um, so I don't know if it's that people don't know, or as I suspect that because we're all in the helping profession, we're so busy helping other people, we often don't prioritize our own needs, or we may think we should be able to manage it on our own. Um, so I'm definitely welcome to the discussion um, at the end. Thank you. All right, excellent. And uh, I'm going to put the spotlight now on uh, Dr. Karen Saperson's spotlight video, and here we go. So Dr. Saperson is a professor, also in the psychiatry uh, department, uh, but she is also the associate chair for the same department, so the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences. She's the academic head of the Division of Geriatric Psychiatry and is currently the chair-elect of their specialty committee. She is focusing on um, medical education throughout her career, and she's had a huge impact in this area. So I look forward to hearing kind of what uh, she has to say about her initiatives. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Teresa. And hello, everybody. And I hope everyone is doing as well as can be expected during this really challenging time for, for all of us in, in healthcare and in education. Um, Teresa has asked me to share what our department has done in terms of an initiative. 
uh, for an organization to take a stepped approach to trying to support our residents, faculty, and staff. And I'm going to describe a five-step approach. So as a department of psychiatry, you know, I think this COVID came out of left field um, and really nobody was prepared. But as the Department of Psychiatry and the Faculty of Health Sciences, we quickly recognized that people would be looking to us for some guidance and support and help in setting up their own supports for mental health and wellness aspects of the workforce. So I'm very fortunate to be part of a department where people are engaged and step up and have are willing to share their expertise. So our very first step, step number one in our five-step approach was setting up a wellness working group. And in that group, people were asked to volunteer and some people were, were tapped on the shoulder and asked to share their expertise because we have experts in trauma, in anxiety, um, and of course, Randy as a CBT expert and others uh, all stepped up immediately and the wellness working group has tried to plan a roadmap or a route for department interventions during this time. Step two was really doing a needs assessment. So we, we thought as a group that we knew what was going on it was really important to reach all sectors of our department. And so we initiated a survey, a short five minute survey, and we have continued to do surveys, um, rolling them out every three to four weeks. And I'll share with you some of the results because the themes have changed certainly over the time of these last 12 weeks. The third step was to implement some of the findings from the survey. So what do people need? How can we as a department respond? Um, and we took two main approaches with implementing the change. The one was that communication is key and people want information, but as Randy mentioned, many people, most people in fact, are overwhelmed with information. So there's the news and there's Twitter and there's um, updates from one's professional organization. So we undertook to develop a COVID-19 tab on our department website, where we tried to curate in the best possible way, um, high yield resources that were evidence informed and that would be pertinent and to keep updating those. So we have different sections on our COVID tab and anybody is welcome to have a look at these. If you go to the Department of Psychiatry and, and open the COVID tab, um, we've, we've collated the updates from the Faculty of Health Sciences and links to the hospital updates. We've put in place um, anxiety related resources, parenting related resources, uh, resources on how to teach in the time of COVID because for many people all of this online teaching is completely new. So that was step number three. Uh, and step number four was to implement the second arm of what came out of the needs assessment and that was um, there was clear need for some peer support. So we formed a weekly drop-in peer support uh, wellness group and that was open to staff, residents and faculty. Um, and there has been varying uptake, so quite a flurry of uptake in the beginning of this. And, and it has, as Randy has described, tapered off a little bit in that um, we have fewer people coming. And we, in our ongoing rolling surveys, are trying to tap into that. What is that all about? What are the barriers? Because clearly people are distressed. And so uh, what, what other formats would be more helpful? Do people need one-on-one? -on -one? One of the features of our drop-in group is that it is very heterogeneous. So it could be an admin support person within the department. You could be a junior faculty, senior faculty, you could be a resident. And so one of the questions was, do people feel safe in using that heterogeneity or do people prefer a more homogenous group? And then the fifth arm, of course, of our five-step approach was to have very active, regular and intense uh, collaboration with our partners. So that's the two hospitals, Bode and the HHS group, and Randy and colleagues in the St. Joe's group. Um, and met, there are members of the HHS and St. Joe's wellness initiatives are members of our wellness working group to ensure that. And the Faculty of Health Sciences. So Mark Walton very kindly reached out. And this initiative is a result of one of those collaborations. Um, people may be interested to know that the themes from our um, surveys, which by the way, we've had an excellent response rate for surveys, a 30 to 35% response in each of our surveys. 
Um, in, in the beginning, the overwhelming theme was fear of COVID, of contracting it, of passing it on, of poor outcomes, all of that. And that has certainly changed over time where that still remains a sub-theme, but really people are much more focused on um, the loss of structure, the loss of demarcation between their work and their family life, uh, loss of academic productivity, uh, concern around loss of income for a large sector, and very prominently, loneliness has come through as a theme. We've just launched our most recent survey. I don't have the results to share yet because that closes on Wednesday. Um, but looking at some of the preliminary results, uh, the whole issue of uh, COVID fatigue and theme of uncertainty and how long this is going to carry on is, is prominent. So I think one of the other points I want to highlight is that you know, we start our support group every time with a form of disclaimer because in thinking about everybody's distress, it is really important to be able to demarcate what is a, a reaction to stress that is expected and anticipated in everybody and where does that cross, up, cross over the threshold into needing care and treatment. Um, and there is a degree of, um, of skill required in making that determination. And I know other department leaders have reached out to our members and have asked for some help in that, how to ask, how do I recognize burnout? How do I recognize compassion fatigue? How do I recognize when there is a need to provide some specific therapeutic intervention uh, for my colleagues. Um, and uh, so I think um, I, I'm going to leave it there just to say that uh, for any reading, uh, Teresa, if I can ask you to publicize the Shanafelt article from April 20. Uh, Shanafelt is um, one of the leading authors looking at specifically at physician burnout, resilience, wellness. Um, and he published, and he and his colleagues published an article looking at anxiety among healthcare workers. And he, he divided all of the themes into five headings. And I think that resonates with our surveys and with a lot of what we've heard today from the other panelists, where the, the themes are, the, the, the plea from healthcare workers are, hear me, protect me, prepare me, support me, and care for me. Um, the hear me is just acknowledge my distress, um, and respond to it. Protect me is if there is danger in the work that I'm doing, how can my organization step in to make sure that I'm protected? Prepare me means make sure I'm trained, that I know how to do things like donning and doffing, using PPE. Support me when, so when I'm feeling the distress, show me where I can go for help and care for me. This is um, if, it, if it reaches the state where I need, where I need actual care related to COVID, make sure that I'm, uh, that, that holistic um, 360 support is there for me. So I'm gonna end there, but I'd be very happy to, to take questions. And thank you again, Teresa, for, for organizing this. Okay, so I'm gonna actually leave that up for a couple of minutes if people want to do a screen capture. I've also linked to the article as it is a COVID related article, it's open access. So everyone should be able to access this paper. JAMA has done a real service to the world by being able to offer that. So thanks to them, they have no power over me other than I'd love to someday publish in their journal. Um, <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna invite all the speakers now. I'm gonna stop screen sharing now that I'm done vamping so you guys have a moment there, but you can also refer to that article. Definitely send that around to your leadership. Definitely share it with your colleagues. I think that makes a big sense. So we have everyone with their, um, we have everyone with their video on. So I'll um, probably stop the stoplight on, uh, on Karen and now invite everyone to kind of have a, have a dialogue here. Now, I noticed that there are some questions um, from the group around what would be services for people who are not in the Hamilton area, maybe not working uh, directly. And uh, so I thought, Randy, maybe you can comment. Um, again, it, it sounds like your service is uh, quite open to everyone. Can, and you said the catchment was all the way from like Fort Erie all the way to London, you said, is included in your catchment? Oh, yeah. Area? Yeah. So anywhere in southwestern Ontario. So um, feel free to give us a call. And I see that you put the link there, um, Teresa. So you can um, direct people there and there's a, they can fill in a web uh, page to uh, do the self-referral or they can call the number. 
but maybe I'll start with Mark and see what are some of the reflections about the different work that people are doing? Do you see, I, I guarantee you can spot some themes that you've been thinking about and maybe we can have you talk while people think about the questions they want to ask and we'll open that up. You know, with, within faculty affairs, um, you know, we set up and Karen and I had met probably now three months ago about um, faculty wellness and resilience and, and uh, she'd share that article with me, which was so powerful. We put together, especially with COVID, um, an ad hoc uh, wellness group, um, and I've just shared the the one of the websites that we put together just for some COVID resources. And there's people are feeling overwhelmed, so uh, take it as you can feel you can look at it. The other part that I think is super important is, you know, everybody looks to leaders to support them during times of uh, crisis and, and pandemic, and the the leaders the chairs the vice deans are likewise feeling uh, a lot of stress um, and concern and a feeling of perhaps an inability to support their faculty members as much as possible so we we've had a number of um, you know everything's zoom these days so we've had a number of zoom and webex meetings um, on how we can support the leaders to support their faculty members and there's there is one tab in um, the faculty affairs website that goes into, you know, what, what can leaders do within the times of uh, crisis and, and pandemic. Um, there's lots of, um, you know, look at that jam where it's just so rich uh, with so many different uh, aspects. But one of the big ones is, you know, the conflict and contrast between personal and professional obligations. And where, you know, in a, in a digital world, it just seems to be the lines are so blurred. Part of the, the, uh, the challenge, I think, is getting everybody comfortable in, the, in a safe place to share um, and um, you know, dealing with that uh, uncertainty. The other aspect, and we, you know, uh, Teresa knows because we've been emailing back and forth about how um, you know, I think uh, all of our partners are feeling concern and how do, the par how do we support our partners and our partners can support uh, us uh, within our, our job, both within research and education and healthcare delivery. So I think that's, you know, that's a really important part of it because I think our partners have concern um, for us as we, we do our jobs um, uh, and our partners may be also involved in healthcare. So how do we, you know, uh, support everybody uh, involved? Um, I, I look at this as just a start. Um, I am by far not an expert at all. Yeah, in this, but uh, I think uh, what I can do to help is to make sure we get people together and collaborate and get um, the smart people in the room that really can help us um, with uh, developing a, a, a safety net, if you like, people like Dr. Sapson, Dr. McCabe, Dr. Atkinson, and, and, and others that are, um, you know, in this webinar, um, and uh, just develop a, a feeling of uh, a culture of uh, support and safety. So thank you. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. Managing triggers. Okay, so this is a great question from Linda. Thank you, Linda. Um, what are some tips that you have for managing triggers that are surfacing from previous losses and previous situations? How might we kind of support people who might have had other mental health issues, addiction issues, other things that have come up before that uh, might be coming about? I could jump in there, Teresa. Um, yeah, I think if you're having, if someone's having something come up and maybe related to pre-existing things, um, I think not to deal with it alone. Like if you have a support network, someone you're close to that you can speak to about what you're going through and get some important in, in, insights, and it may be, how did you deal with it in the past? Can you still deal with it in the same way? All of our coping things that people traditionally do, like going to the gym, you know, um, you, you know, going to see people, like we can't do a lot of the things. So that that's hard because, you know, and, and we see, you mentioned addiction, Teresa, and like drinking is, is up, you know what I mean? People are at home, like doing maybe unhealthy coping behaviors. So I think talking, using the support system, but then we saw on the Jamboard, people are feeling alone and lonely. And maybe they don't have their uh, support system. You know, they, they haven't been able to do those rituals of our society, like weddings, funerals, just being with people are, are also taken away. So that's why then I would say, call the line. If you're in doubt, call the line, uh, whether it's the peer support line or our, our line, just get, get you might one conversation or there's other supports there that could help someone. Because I think if, you're, if you have something pre-existing on board, then you're probably more vulnerable 
um, and we want to make sure you have a good outcome through this time and you have the support that you need because I think a lot of times we have these supports and I mentioned it's our own experience with our our support line people don't access it so accessibility and, and maybe why do people not access it that's a whole other uh, conversation but I think taking that plunge and, and that's hard is that first step to make the call or to complete the online referral but then I think that will help um, you feel much better to just uh, take that one step in that right direction and people you've done studies where they people just booking an appointment to get help already feel a little bit better so we can't under you know score how important that is to reach out Excellent. That's a, that's a very great point. Um, definitely just even reaching out and asking for help can be a huge first step for many. Um, Karen, in your peer support stuff uh, that you've been working on, can you tell us a little bit about what that feels and looks like? And um, does that help people get over that hump, do you think? Uh, uh, or does it maybe fend off the need to actually go further? Um, so I think that the the for people who attend the peer support group, um, we do a, ch a check in, and they seem to find it really helpful. Uh, but the uptake in terms we have a department of over four hundred people, and we we've had numbers of around you know fifteen or fewer people. So that is not um, a high percentage of uptake. And so we are trying to explore. Uh, what would be more helpful? Do people simply not need this because they're coping? So we, we've asked that question, do you feel you're coping well? And we give a, a little bit of a scale. Um, and we're trying at the same time to explore some of the barriers. And certainly um, some of the barriers that have emerged to date are that people don't necessarily feel safe sharing in a group. Um, there is a stigma. And some of the literature suggests that perhaps these sorts of support should not be run by members of one's own department. So I think that's something that we're looking at as well, that people might feel safer with a more neutral facilitator. I want to also just uh, echo something that Mark said in talking about supports for leaders, because while uh, Randy has spoken and Bode about also not having a lot of calls and for us, for our support group, not being inundated as we had anticipated, the um, appetite for support for leaders has exceeded the capacity. So our two members of our department, Karen Roa and Sabina Nagpal, have facilitated a number of groups across campus and also for hospital leadership to help leaders, support leaders to support the people they work with. And there, the, they cannot keep up with the demand. So it seems like reaching out for help um, altruistically to help others, people step forward immediately and are very keen to do so. Whereas perhaps at the moment, reaching out for one's own help, there has been less uptake than before. That resonates with what I'm seeing. Um, I think it's hard to reach out to your colleagues that you see every day and having some arms like this. so I think that for everyone who's not in psychiatry, the resources that Randy and, uh, and Bodhi can, can offer might be, might be good solutions. Um, for those of uh, you who are psychiatrists or psychologists that are working in the clinical space, and it, it sounds like Randy had suggested that CAMH has some resources and there's the ECHO project as well for communities of practice that they built. Um, and I think there are some resources out there, but uh, definitely this panel's here to answer more questions. Um, any other questions from the group here? Hi, it's Peter Ellis here. I'm the uh, division head for medical oncology. So, hi, Peter. Uh, hi, hi. So thanks very much. I think this has been a, um, a very good thing uh, in terms of getting some resources. So the Cancer Center has continued to operate um, on a modified sort of way, but the majority of people are still getting treatment. So unlike most ambulatory services, um, you know, we've, we've continued. We're doing a lot of telephone assessment of patients, but obviously you have to come in to get treatment. So it's modified the way we work. Um, you know, we're faced with issues around social distancing in clinical areas. And so there's stress on how many people are in a clinical area that creates issues around learners. Um, you know, people have had to modify their clinical ways. So that, you know, the focus was to ensure that the clinical work continued. And so the academic sort of output, the academic work sort of went a bit by the wayside. And so I'm seeing stress on multiple levels. I'm seeing stress on people um, who feel that their academic contributions have, have just sort of 
are not valued, are not thought to be important because they've been pushed to the wayside. People who feel that they just can't do any more. Um, and, and I guess, I, I think the list of resources is really great, but what is a leader, uh, what, what can I do to just try to promote resiliency, particularly if people aren't necessarily gonna take up the offers of support that did exist? Yeah, that's a, that's a challenging question. And so I am thrilled that there are a bunch of experts on the line that can take that one. So thanks, Peter. I, I wonder about that too. I, I empathize with uh, what you're saying there because there's a lot of people that maybe you spot burnout, you, maybe you're diagnosing it even, um, and, and they're not looking for help. They're, they're, they're not willing to help. They're kind of in that pre-contemplation stage. They're not quite recognizing it themselves. Uh, Bodhi, you haven't had a chance to speak. Uh, I don't know if that puts you in too much of a spot, but I'm just wondering, what are, what are your thoughts there? Well, I'll probably defer to Karen on this one because I think that she has done a little bit of work specifically um, related to the question that was just asked. Karen, do you want to give it a okay, shot? Yeah, Karen, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll st thank you. I'll say th there are no magic solutions, N not, not with us, not in the literature. Um, and so really um, some ideas which haven't been tested, but which our small group in our department leadership have talked about, Peter, is um, I think people respond to stories. And if you look at, at what makes people step forward uh, pre-COVID, if you look at um, the Bell Let's Talk campaign, for example, that I think has done so much to reduce the stigma around mental illness and for allowing people to step forward um, and to, and what, what has been a big part of that campaign has had leaders or, or prominent people share their stories. So in our own department, you know, instead of um, having department meetings where we just sort of throw information at people, uh, at our last department meeting, we, we featured members of the department and asked them to share their experiences. Um, and we've had huge attendance at our department meeting. So in real time, pre-COVID, we, if we had 30 people out of 400 show up for a department meeting, we, that was a good day. We're now having over 100 people regularly show up on Zoom. Um, and I think stories are powerful. So, you know, having somebody, perhaps someone in a, in a position of leadership or choosing different people from across departments to each take five minutes to share their story can be a very powerful tool. That's not, um, that's not a solution, Peter, but it may be a way to sort of help people feel really the universality of this experience, that they're not alone, that the fatigue is widespread, um, that we're all adjusting and doing the very best that we can. And so that's just one idea. All right, and I think Randy said that she would like to add, so uh, yeah. Oh yeah, so um, Peter, it's Sounds like people are coming to you uh, with their concerns or you're seeing their bring their concern. Um, the article uh, Karen um, showed that idea of being heard is so important. So like their concerns are heard and validated. So just as a leader, taking hearing concerns, giving a forum to bring the concerns, listen, validate, and then show that okay, not valuing because you your question that people aren't feeling academic valued really it's not that it's not valued it's just that they're trying to protect learners and protect research participants so research and trainees have been kind of have been kind of put on hold um, so how to then clarify that that's on hold but we're working to bring those aspects back in a safe way so you know you're taking the concerns you're validating providing support and that opportunity for them to air those concerns and then showing them that you're solution focused that as you're you're le under your leadership you know you're going to keep them informed with communication of as to when those pieces can come back online and maybe there are some things that will come up that are things that can be addressed in the meantime. So when people, especially in middle management or at the bottom, like the front line, feel like they're not being heard, um, then that really contributes to burnout because then they're like, well, what's the point? No one's listening to me. And, and you know, often at the front line, there are really important concerns that in leadership we can listen to to inform um, the steps we take. And maybe we can be, um, that's the kind of communication of when things are coming down the pipeline that if people know, oh, well, in September, we're hoping this is what it's going to look like, then they know, okay, there's light at the end of this tunnel. It's not going to go forever, this vacuum we're in. So I think 
that other piece of, of providing information in a timely way makes people feel like, okay, I've been heard and there's a plan in place. Uh, it, if I can just add something, um, that Teresa, as well, to what Randy has said. The other thing is to actively and deliberately monitor for burnout in, in your colleagues. Because, um, you know, that kind of disengaging, feeling exhausted, um, feeling completely drained, uh, that, that, that once again has crossed, crossed one of those transition points. And th those individuals may need some specific help in addition to what um, Randy has already said. Uh, if, if I could just add, um, the, the um, coaching sessions through organizational development may be a resource that would be available to you. And, and I think uh, it's really great to hear that you're um, sharing this here because I imagine that there are a number of other people probably in your role who, who may not have a, um, a forum where they can ask questions like this or, or may not be aware of this webinar or may not feel comfortable asking the questions. The coaching sessions are really helpful. They're about 30 minutes and, and they might be able to get um, some tips on how you can support the folks that you work with. One of the things that we are um, considering, and I think Karen alluded to that, is, is wondering why we aren't getting uh, uh, inundated by um, folks calling in for support. And, and one of the things that we thought about is, although it's a, a number of hospitals in the corporation, there is also a sense that people might value anonymity. And, and how do you generate, how do you create that? And, and, and perhaps instead of thinking just within the um, corporation, we can think province-wide where you can have a uh, uh, infrastructure that would create some semblance of anonymity for the people who are calling in, and they might make feel more, much more comfortable. Um, there's a model right um, right now that I'm understanding um, in the U.S. where they have uh, about a thousand physicians, psychiatrists who have signed up to be volunteers, and so you can be calling from Nebraska, and the physician who supports you is in New York, and, and that way you perhaps feel much more comfortable speaking, and, and so we're uh, it's, it's a future state, but it's certainly something that I think might speak to some of the um, limitations that people have in asking for help. I guess there's been a nomination by Dr. Walton that maybe there's a, there's a, there's a cool innovation um, that the Department of Peace has put together. Ines, are you willing to share? Uh, sure. Thank you, Teresa, and um, all, all the panel committee. I, I have uh, learned quite a bit about the resources that are available. I just want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Inas al -Guhari. I'm a neonatologist and a pediatrician in the PEDS department. I'm also the program director for the Neonatal Perinatal uh, Fellowship Program. Um, I have been interested in wellness, resilience, and burnout for about now two years since I started uh, my role as the program director. And we have been doing regular measurement with different tools. We started um, by measuring the burnout um, and psychological safety in our program and uh, comparing that to what has been published in the literature in neonatal intensive care units. We also then uh, moved to what can we do with this information? So we invited all stakeholders in our division, including clinical manager, QI experts, myself, academic uh, coaching uh, chair and uh, chief residents to attend uh, an Institute of Health um, Improvement, the IHI Joy in Work course, which was um, a very helpful course with, um, we had two coaches to help us implement some of the projects that came about. The IHI Joy in Work has actually a white paper on how to implement Joy in Work, which actually talks about more the, the other aspect of um, enhancing and promoting resilience and psychological safety and decreasing burnout. I feel that most of what we talked about today is about individual resources like peer support and um, um, sort of the different sessions that people can drop in, which fantastic. I do feel also that there is, uh, not only that, that I feel, but in the literature that there is the different aspect of promoting wellness in physicians, which is the institutional aspect the systemic aspects. What um, Karen had talked about that we need to remove that stigma. We need to be able to talk as physicians that yes, we cannot do it anymore. I need to stop uh, what I'm doing right now. I need a break. I feel depressed. I feel burnt out. We need to, to actually remove that stigma completely. And that requires changing the culture. 
being able to safely talk about it with your colleagues, with your division head, with the PEDS department, um, with, with Mark Walton, with Teresa Chan as my supervisor in, in the CE program. Um, so that's, that's really important to be able to talk about it. But when we talk about it, then we encourage residents and we train them to be able to also talk about it. Shouldn't be a stigma anymore because that's important for wellness and for patient care. What we did then, we implemented the Join Work, which is, uh, has four steps into it. It's a systemic approach to improving wellness. It starts with the conversations, what matters to you? And you have a coach there to train you how to run these conversations. You have to establish psychological safety within your actual division, with your learners, with your colleagues, and so forth. And we started to do that. That was two years ago. Um, and, and then you take these conversations and you run your survey and so forth. Then you prioritize the issues. We came up with 20 recommendations out of those survey, um, sort of things that we need to address. Then we brought it back to the residents. We implemented that with our residents. We have about 30 uh, of them. And then with them, we prioritized the top three, pebbles in, in their shoes that we need to address. And then we actually uh, developed projects that we addressed them. The main things that they had, one was the, they wanted to spend more family time. They wanted more autonomy in terms of scheduling. They want us to change how we schedule them, the time of handover. Two was creating more efficiency in the work, particularly documentation. We all know EMR is a, is a, is a huge issue. Um, and the documentation itself. So we developed a project about that. Three was about making rounds shorter and handover more structured. So we started with these three projects and we had the assessment done afterwards. We started with the first project was the changing in the handover and the call schedule and we ran a lot of surveys and so forth then we implemented that and we measured we actually ended up improving the burnout rates as measured by we use the tool uh, provided from the joy and work uh, course ihi course not the maslac but it's built on the maslac and we showed significant improvement we now had completed our documentation optimization project and also the rounds what was very interesting that with COVID, what I did is that I took the, the top priorities that they have identified, I implemented weekly town halls with them, with our residents, and every time I took notes about what is their priority, what are the pebbles in their shoes, I took it back to management, tried to solve some of them and was successful in some and not successful in some, like some would take time, brought it back the following week immediately. And, um, and their sense right now, we haven't done our measurement right now, we're running that next week, but their sense of wellness is amazing. You can see that with the engagement. Like we run the town halls initially, half of them wouldn't share their video. Right now, like all the videos are like, they're, they're open through cameras, they are sharing safely, they, they talk about their concerns completely in a safe um, way, and they feel otherwise well, because they feel that they are here, we feel that we prioritize their wellness, we prioritize the learning, we talk transparently about what are the limitations that we have. Like they are very, um, you are very affected by that there are no electives outside and so forth. And I talk about this openly and like, how can we adjust this? Um, so what, I, what I'm trying to say is that all these resources are extremely important, but everybody's overwhelmed by the resources and overwhelmed by the work? And how can we, at a systemic level, an institutional level, leadership development, how can we enhance and support the resources that are provided on an individual level? Okay, that's so thank beautiful. you so much for, for sharing all the resources. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I'm just gonna wrap this up right now, but we can hang around for another half hour. The Zoom link's not gonna end, but I wanted to make sure that all our panelists are still here. I wanted to have everyone do me a favor. I'm gonna have everyone turn on their video, turn on their audio, and we're just gonna actually do a round of applause. This is something that a lot of speakers no longer have access to. So you can humor me for a couple of seconds. I usually ask everyone to do that just at the end as part of a ritual that we're trying to, trying to create. So at the very least, your audio on if you can. So unmute and, uh, and uh, 
uh, join me in a round of applause. Thank you so much to everyone for sharing and our guest speakers and also our surprise speakers, the ones that didn't know they were going to be speaking and talking today. Thank you so much for stepping up.